When we consider that every day, the entire European Union population is killed, that would be probably a, a huge crime against humanity, right? And that's a reality for animals. 450 millions of animals are killed per day, and this is only for food. Farm animals, lab animals, companion animals, animals used in sport, entertainment, working animals, and wild animals in nature and in captivity. They are all victims of massive crimes against animality. If we consider protecting really the, the legal interests or rights of animals, at least the fundamental ones to live, to be free, and to be well protected, and condemning all the crimes that are causing prejudice to these fundamental rights, the world would change, right? <laughs> that would be a new world, a new world of animal justice. Salut Sabine, how are you? Salut Jamie, very well, and you? Yeah, very good, very good. Well, it's wonderful to have you back for the second time. There aren't many guests who've been on twice. We talked in episode 66, I mean, it was a fascinating conversation where I think I signed you up as a celebrity sentientist with a broadly naturalistic worldview and a sort of sentiocentric moral scope. And you shared a very powerful story about one of the turning points in your philosophical journey about being taken to see bullfighting at the edges of four and five. So hopefully people will go back and listen to that episode to understand your philosophical journey. But because we already covered the, you know, the what's real questions and the who matters and the what matters questions there, you've come back to focus again on our final question about how to make a better world, particularly in the context of the World Animal Justice Organization you're driving at the moment. So it's brilliant to have you back on to talk about those some of those practical implications for how we can make things better. But before we get into those questions, do you want to just remind people who you are and just give a quick introduction to yourself? And then we can get into the world animal justice story. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be back on your great channel where conscious people uh, care for sentient animals. And yeah, so I'm Sabine Brels. I'm French. I'm a lawyer and I specialize in animal law internationally and in comparative animal law as well. I've been driving the Global Animal Law Organization for seven years. And afterwards, I've been working for great NGOs like the World Federation for Animals, the Eurogroup for Animals, and Compassion in World Farming. And since last year, I decided to start a new NGO called World Animal Justice in order to go further in international law to protect animals against crimes against animality and also to to promote their their fundamental rights in animal law as well thank you yeah that's great um and this whole field of international law is quite challenging for people to get their heads around it certainly is for me because i think most of us are quite comfortable with the idea of a, a national law you know there's one set of law ideally a rule of law that applies it to everybody although we know that's not always done well. If you're a citizen in the country, then the law applies to you, whether you like it or not. And if you don't follow the laws, they're generally enforced to some degree. You know, there might be a police force or some state mechanisms that enforce the law. But things at the international level seem to be to be much more messy. You know, there are ideas of international law, but there are different chunks of international law that apply to different places. So people might be familiar that there's international law about, you know, maritime stuff or humanitarian law or laws that govern things like genocides and wars. Uh, so there are lots of different chunks of law. There are different institutions like the ICJ and the ICC that people might have heard of, organisations like the UN, regional organisations as well, that all seem to be doing different things. And those different chunks of law don't even seem to apply consistently because there are certain countries or certain areas of the world that just are outside of the jurisdictions and don't sign up. And even some of those that are inside the jurisdiction seem to regularly ignore international law too. So I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but I just wanted to make the point that it seems to be a much more complex space to work in because simply speaking, you know, we don't have a world government in the same way as you do for a nation. So I don't know, before we get into world animal justice, if there was any more observations you wanted to share about the challenges of working in the international law space. 
or whether I've sort of summarized the the confusion and the difficulty. It's a great yeah summary. It's, it's very complex, as you said, and there's this big United Nations machinery with the, all these agencies and other intergovernmental organizations and, and international instruments that have, of course, uh, issues about enforcement. But enforcing animal law, especially, is a, is a common issue. Unfortunately, even at national level or regional level, for instance, the European Union that has a great corpus for animal welfare protection. I mean, a great for a region of the world, <laughs> still a lot of gaps. Uh, but at every level, enforcing animal laws can be an issue. However, as you said, uh, national at national level, there is probably more means for enforcement than in international law. Even if some legally binding instruments can put some means uh, in force to 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 foster their their good application. For instance, we have the economical sanctions. We have the the international court of justice that can have the, the possibility to to sanction some countries infringing these provisions, or we can also have, as you said, the International Criminal Court, which is on our perspective here with World Animal Justice, especially for crimes against humanity. And yes, for instance, the Convention on Genocides is not the same that the, than the Rome Statutes for the Crimes Against Humanity. Um, and so indeed it can, it can make international very complex. And for us, it's also an opportunity because it's, it's a rich possibilities and, and avenues to promote better protection for animals through various ways, also via health or environmental protections that are making more and more advancements in international law, and maybe I will develop it later on. Yeah, so it's it's complex and maybe confusing, but that also gives you maybe more ways in to what we're talking about today. And and you you mentioned this already, but in the sphere of international law or regional law, you know there are already some there's some consideration for non-human animals, non-human sentient beings already in law. But as you said, you know the enforcement is a challenge. But generally, the international law space remains overwhelmingly anthropocentric it's nearly all about humans so in that context world animal justice is obviously going to be an interesting intervention so yeah if you could just introduce us to what a world animal justice is and why you've founded it that'd be a good place to start yeah thank you jamie well yes the anthropocentric paradigm is is predominant in international law for sure so changing towards a new animal justice paradigm would be a, a small animal law revolution, of course, probably needed from a, a moral perspective and extending our scope of consideration for animals to extend crimes against animals to be considered as a global issue, because it is, it is not limited to, to national frontiers, crimes Massive crimes against animals happen every day, everywhere, worldwide. So that's why it's a, it's truly a global issue. And it's also our collective responsibility to tackle this issue and to tackle it globally. Because the way we treat animals and sentient animals especially is, of course, defining our humanity. So now back more with World Animal Justice Projects. Well, when we consider that every day, the entire European Union population is killed. That would be probably a, a huge crime against humanity, right? And, and, and that's a reality for animals. I mean, 450 millions, 450 millions of animals are killed per day. And this is only for food. It's almost impossible to get your head around. Yes. I mean, every breath we take, every second, it's, it's 5,000 animals killed. It's, it's crazy. It's unbelievable. And that's not acceptable when we know that we can do otherwise, that this is avoidable. And here it's only animal slaughtered for food. So I'm not counting here all the animal killed for experiments, wild animals, stray companion animals, and so on. So there, there's much more actually. 
And today, there is nothing to protect animals for crimes against animality internationally. So that's from this very observation and from reading the very definition of crimes against humanity, which is massive murders, sequestrations, enslavement, deportations, torture, violences, including sexual violence, this is the very definition of crimes against humanity. And this is actually what is happening against animals every day. And most of these crimes, when they are for factory farming or experiments or some uh, institutionalized uses or abuses of animals, can be still very legal, right? Because if some countries have some, yes, anti-cruelty laws, are pro-welfare laws for animals. It's usually to reduce the suffering of these exploited animals or to condemn some acts of cruelty most of the time against companion animals. But we have to be aware that one third of the countries today still have nothing to protect animals, not even the basic anti-cruelty laws. One third of the countries have nothing and some of the worst cruel practices are still allowed or even legal in some countries. For instance, in, in France, where I live, force feeding for foie gras or bullfightings are still happening every summertime in south of France, where I live. And we can say that force feeding for foie gras and bullfightings are a kind of torture against animals. And we can do, of course, otherwise. So this is this kind of controversial practices that can probably be challenged internationally and probably can have a momentum or a global consensus saying, yeah, that's wrong for, for animals, but also for our human dignity to continue to make so much animal victims when we can do otherwise, of course. So this is just some examples, but just to raise that even if there's more and more animal laws, and that's great, but still, it's not enough. It's not enough to, to really protect them well and to really ensure their, their welfare. Why also? Because their rights, their fundamental rights to live, to be free and to be well treated are not recognized and not protected by the law and even not in international law. There is some countries, especially in the Indian region and in South America, that began to grant some rights for uh, great apes or for great mammals in some circumstances, most of the time when they were in bad conditions in zoos. So that's the, the bridge opening. And that's a great news to open this bridge to non-human animals, right? But it's, it's very premises. And here we, with world animal justice, well, what we want to, to do is to, to go faster and higher, to, to make people realize and decision makers that criminality against animals is huge, but massive millions of them, as we said. And this concerns every category of animals, farm animals, lab animals, companion animals, animals used in sport, entertainment, working animals, and wild animals in nature and in captivity. They are all victims of massive crimes against animality. And even if there is some things specific to protect, for instance, wild species when they are endangered, or companion animals against some act of cruelty, or farm animals for having a bit more welfare or a bit less suffering. We are not taking this concern for the gravity it is. And if it would be, if we would do the same to humans that we are doing daily to animals worldwide, it would seem unbelievable that it would be still legal and that we won't just cry for genocides and crimes against humanity. So, uh, my goal here with World Animal Justice and our goal, because we are a collective of experts from the fifth continent, and we have the, the chance to be supported by more and more worldwide NGOs like Asia for Animals, 
to really advocate in this sense based on a, a solid legal theory and expertise we want to this to lead to concrete actions and what one of these concrete action if I, if i may is to to ask for for instance to the international criminal court to recognize the crimes against animality why we can think we have a chance to do that because actually the international criminal court is considering to include the crimes against environments into the Rome statutes. It, it's, a, it's a great news. Uh, it's very recent. So a door is opening here. And even Belgium uh, last week uh, adopted a new law in its penal code uh, to condemn the crimes of ecocides, so damages to environments, to up to 20 years in prisons and 1.6 million of fines. So it's, it's a big crime. Uh, and there's a door opening now for ecocide or crimes against environment to be taken very seriously. And for me, there is a chance for a crimes against animality or suicide to be also considered very seriously as a next step. Because when we look at international law, it began with humans protection, then environmental protection, and now more and more it's opening to consider animals protection because as far as animals are staying the are remaining the the missing piece of the puzzle we are losing something we cannot protect humans and environment well without taking into consideration animals that's why now the one health concept is including animals and that we realize that we are one life and that all individuals need to be protected if we want to protect the rest of the web of life and it seems to echo a lot of what's going on in the sort of general zeitgeist around the world. And it's really a reflection, again, of anthropocentrism, where, you know, most cultures and nations around the world and groups of people recognize crimes against humanity, as you say. They recognize the rights of humans in reasonably deep ways, at least to some extent. And as our concern for our planet has developed, given the threats of climate change and pollution and all the other things that have gone on, we've sort of jumped from this anthropocentric focus and said, oh, now we need to worry about eco as well. We need to worry about the planet and the environment. But as you say, we seem to have, in that expansion of moral scope, we've missed out many quadrillions of suffering beings that actually can be directly, morally and ethically harmed in a way that I would argue a rock and a river a tree hasn't. So it feels like the international law space is could well make that same mistake where there's, as you say, the ICC focuses on crimes against humanity. It now considers crimes against the environment. So you go from homicide and a concern for homicide to a concern for ecocide. But who's thought of, as you said, suicide, or I like the term senticide, which could imply, you know, involves the harmful killing of any sentient being, human or not, right? What, why isn't that in the zeitgeist? Um, so yeah, it's, I, I think it's fascinating because there's all sorts of different interventions we might take to try and push non-human sentient beings back in to fill that puzzle picture out. But um, doing that at the international law level seems very compelling. And you've you've already answered one of my other questions, which was in a way sort of why justice, right? So there are a bunch of different initiatives going on at different levels, some of them global, that have animals in mind. You've mentioned the One Health idea that is considering yes, human health, but also planetary health and non-human health. Um, there are many initiatives around ideas of welfare, and I would argue even a minimal concern for welfare should imply essentially the transition to end animal exploitation. But the reality of many welfare initiatives doesn't follow that path. As you said, it's more about you know the exploitation and the harm will continue. We'll just be slightly less egregiously cruel as we do it. And I guess you answered the question by saying, look, that's not enough. It wouldn't be enough for humans, right? Just to say, carry on exploiting and harming, but just do it a little less painfully. And it shouldn't be enough for non-human sentient beings as well. So you answered that question already about why it's about fundamental rights and justice. But it is also interesting because another one of my questions is, well, why focus on criminal law? Because you could think about international environmental law being a way into this. Others are. You could think about international law to do with human health, 
being a way into this. You could think about international rights being another way into that. You could think about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and working to extend that to the Universal Declaration of Sentient Rights, which we talked about last time. But again, the criminal law focus is really interesting because, again, it forces you to take these things seriously and as genuinely criminal acts, you know, from the perspective of the victims. It sort of cuts right to the heart of that. It cuts through a sort of more appeasing welfare story or a story about tweaking. And it's just like, from the perspective of the victim, this is a crime and we should treat it as such. So, yeah, so it's a fascinating approach. And so you talked about the fact it's a profession, it's a network of experts and you have a series of partnerships you're working on as as well to try and make this challenge happen. As you said, your sort of goal of getting the ICC to recognise crimes against animality. Is there more you want to tell us about that, the network and the partnerships and who else you're working with and how it links to some of the other initiatives going on? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. What you said before is very, very interesting. And yes, just if I can say a few words about what you said previously. Well, animal justice for me is very strong as crimes against animals or crimes against animality, if we're saying animal kingdom. Justice is important because it's actually, for me, all encompassing. It encompasses the protection of animal welfare and of animal rights. And of course, the question of rights is very important. As you said, it goes beyond the, the welfareist approach of most animal laws today. And because if we consider protecting really the, the legal interests or rights of animals, at least the fundamental right wants to live, to be free and to be well protected and condemning all the crimes that are causing prejudice to these fundamental rights, the world would change, right? <laughs> that would be a new world, a new world of animal justice, where really they would be considered as, as not only sentient and conscious beings, but also as vulnerable beings. Actually, we are the, the dominant species that are committing these crimes against them. And the law, for me, should be the weapon of justice. So the law should protect vulnerable beings from oppressions and from crimes as far as it's avoidable and, and that we can do otherwise and that it's, it's good for it. It's for the common good of, of all, right? And that's where our humanity should aim, right? From a moral perspective to protect always more um, other beings and, and be, go more and more toward this aim of justice for all. And yes, I would just like to, to quote Martha Nussbaum uh, in her book, Justice for Animals from last year. And she said, animals suffer injustice and horrors at our hands every day. The world needs an ethical awakening, a consciousness raising movement of international proportions. And that's also why I decided to create World Animal Justice, because of this need of this new global movement for animal justice and to, to go further than an ethical framework, but to push this ethical framework until a legal framework and a global one, because as we said, it's a global concern. So it cannot be restricted to some uh, countries or regions of the world. And yeah, that's also the, the very aim of world animal justice to, to, to push this question of justice for animals until a legal rights international level. And as you said, for criminal law, indeed, it's to consider the, the gravity of, of, of the crimes of the victims as they are. And also because in criminal law, there is sanctions. Actually, as far as I could see from the last 15 years I'm working in the animal law field, what are the most effective laws to protect animals are anti-cruelty laws. Uh, when they are in penal or criminal codes and where they are assorted of sanctions. And mo the more the sanctions are high and implemented as such by the judges, the best, the better protected are the animals against this act because it's dissuasive. <laughs> and, and also because if it's only, uh, 
goodwill obligations of um, caring for better welfare of animals. But as far as it's just referring to the goodwill of everyone, some people will care for their animals because uh, it's natural for them. But some people will not care because it's not their priority. They don't really care for animals. So we, we cannot rely just on the goodwill of people to better protect animals. Because as you know, there's, there's a whole machinery of traditions of businesses, of money and so on that is in this state of play. And when we consider that two thirds of the countries, so the majority of the countries have anti-cruelty laws. So they consider that cruelty against animals is not okay. And that should be sanctioned by criminal law. And that began with some acts like willingly killing or poisoning or abandoning companion animals, for instance. And there is a few years of prisons and some different fines to maybe uh, some thousands of dollars or euros or whatever. It's, it's a beginning of taking it seriously, right? But if we just say, oh, you have to care for your companion animals, everyone can understand it's very different, right? There is something very stringent and dissuasive and something Okay, I will do it if I want, but if I don't, no, no consequences. And nowadays, in considering all these horrors that Martin Osbom is talking about, or all these amounts of animals killed and suffering every day from human exploitations and abuses, we can easily consider, as you said, that these acts are criminal in nature uh, when it's avoidable. Uh, so we have an intent to continue to do that if we know that we can do otherwise. So this has to be taken seriously enough and it's through criminal law that it can be done. Thank you. And and I think Martha Nussbaum's work is really powerful and it's partly powerful because of who she is, because of her reputation and her background and the, the scope of her work and her reputation. So on the one hand, I'm, I find myself you know, really drawn to her work and her perspective. And it's just so refreshing to find someone of her stature engaging with the animal topic at all. But at the same time, I'm also left frustrated at the dissonance between her sort of clarion call for justice and some of the details of her philosophy where the concept seems to fall away. And this isn't about, you know, let's let's not spend too much time on this. But for example, she doesn't seem to apply her concept of justice to fishes, for example, and given, you know, what she thinks is ex- acceptable to do to them. So, but regardless, you know, let's put that to one side. The the central clarion call for animal justice is important, but we just need to carry it through consistently, not get trapped in some of the dead ends that that uh, people sometimes get trapped in. Yeah, and so yes, world animal justice is definitely caring for for all animals, sentient animals including fishes, of course. They are one of the most massively killed every day. Yeah, com- absolutely. I mean, it dwarfs the scale of most of the land animal agriculture. So I hope the next the next edition of her book will have some substantial updates. But let's see, let's see. And about your other question for for the expert group. Yeah, the expert group and the networks yeah, and the partnerships. Yeah, so it's a very good question. We we have the chance to to have uh, some fifteen people now from the fifth continent, and they are experts in international and animal law, and sometimes also in criminal law. And we have the chance to have uh, Professor Deborah Tsao as an honorary member. And I'm also happy to follow her past because Professor Tsao wrote a paper in 2018 about crimes against animals in international law where she said that crimes against animals require an international response. And that's also a source of inspiration for world animal justice. And I'm really happy that she accepted and that she's now involved in our expert group, where we are actually writing a collective paper in order to define crimes against animality and also in consideration of zoo side or species side or I like also your idea of sentient side and to establish solid legal foundation, a solid legal theory of crimes against animality in order to, to have this, uh, this basis 
for advocacy with a solid expertise before putting more concrete actions in movements. And yes, we were thinking of the International Criminal Court, but we are also thinking of other ways. We are also thinking of the International Court of Justice, the UN judicial organs, which can recognize general principle of law. And as I said before, as far as two thirds of the countries, so the majority of countries have anti-cruelty laws, there is a principle in international law and especially in the sources of international law, saying that when a principle is present in all the legal systems of the civilized, civilized nations, but it's, it's now almost all nations. So when, when a principle is present in the systems of the world, it can have uh, the recognition of being an international principle. So it can bubble up from the national laws and regulations and be taken on at the international level yeah it doesn't have to be imposed top down it can be yeah yeah yes 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 it's a it's it's a way of of yeah of going higher i mean wider <laughs> of having an international recognition so here we can say that anti cruelty i mean that cruelty towards animals for instance can become an international law uh, principle under this general principle of law theory. So we are also exploring this 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 avenue, and there's also other possibilities that we're thinking of, like having a separate a treaty or status for for a new court dedicated to crimes against animals and and suicide or or say genocide against uh, animal population because there's so much crimes actually to 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 deal with if we would have to establish a list that that would be way enough to, to have a special court and probably it's also a, a way a, a really serious avenue to think about because uh, uh, the international criminal court is dealing with crimes against humanity maybe next day is uh, for crimes against environment and here we can maybe find a bridge between environment and animals through maybe wildlife crimes and maybe crimes against animality can go there too but yes it's always good to to think also of, of a separate and specific avenue because it's also a separate uh, subject so it, it's also, yes, relevant to think of a specific ad hoc avenue, uh, especially for, for animals. And I guess that's part of the idea behind the network is that you can, you've can you got people with different types of expertise who can help you find these avenues and ways in and different strategies. Yeah, yeah and we're also working on the strategy because we, we are thinking of incremental steps towards, I mean, in an overarching framework or roadmap to, to have the worst crimes banned first. So when I'm talking of the worst crime here, I'm talking of the most egregious crimes, the most intentional, the most extreme, the most obscene crimes against animals. Uh, for instance, I was talking of bullfightings. I can talk of zoophilia that is still allowed in, in, a, in a few countries worldwide. Secondly, we can think of, of uh, banning uh, cruel methods in the frame of animal uses or abuses. I was talking of foie gras, but there's also vivisections, the live mutilations of animals or boiling animals alive, for instance, that are really cruel methods that are also still legal in some countries. And yes, in the end, we can think of criminalizing all forms of, uh, of animal uh, exploitation and massive killings as far as uh, there is uh, alternative solutions that that can be uh, developed so it's it's a long term it's a long term project but we we are convinced that it can go in the right direction with this growing will to protect animals worldwide this growing consciousness that animals are sentient beings that it's our responsibility to to better protect them so we are we are quite hopeful that it can go in the right direction. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. So you have quite a, a utopian end state where these crimes don't happen and where there is genuine justice. Um, you have an overarching strategy and plan framework that, again, focuses on justice and those 
core fundamental rights and defending those consistently. But then within that, you're quite flexible about how to make that happen. There are different routes. You can focus on the most, most egregious crimes. You can focus on the ICJ or the ICC or a new court or different ways in under that overarching strategy. Does that, that seems a, is that a fair summary of how you're going about it? Yes, we, we are exploring the different avenues right now, and we will probably in our strategy fix the priorities and the priority rules. For now, we want to leave the door open because there is different ways for crimes against animality to, to move on, to advance, and also in national laws. I mean, I put it the case of Belgium. Belgium was the first to recognize ecocide in its penal code. Maybe it will be the first for suicide as well. We, we don't know. Maybe another country. Maybe it will be at supranational level. We don't know. But I think it's important to, to leave the door open just to think about legally, because we, we have this trend to, to have a great worldwide legal expertise. So we are thinking in international law, what we can defend as a theory, what exists in international law that we can push for, for crimes against animality to raise in consideration and, and be recognized as crimes and as a new principle of international law against cruelty towards it, or for recognizing the, the status of victims for animals, for instance, there is different ways and, and and we will find some priorities, but I think that we will try to, to, to fight on all the fronts for this idea, because it's a movement and we want this idea to advance and to move further. Because as we said, it's a long-term objective and there is some steps that we need to achieve. But first, we need this idea to, to grow. This idea of crimes against animality, that it's a reality, that it's grave, that it's worldwide, that it's everyday, and that needs to be legally recognized and legally prohibited. Yeah. Can I ask you about, I guess, one prime example of a major impact your work will have? And that is to do with, I guess, the systems of global animal agriculture. And as you said, this is already an international problem, not just because it happens in lots of places, but because it happens in an international way. So I, as a consumer in the UK, can buy a product from a company that imports it from somewhere else, that engages with another third party who buys a product from a farmer who sends the product to an abattoir. You know, there's a long chain of responsibility there. And in a way, that can be analogous to some crimes against humanity, because often you have the individual who has done the crime has done the killing, but they are part of a state or an institution or a group that ultimately shares the major responsibility for that action. But when you've got these, you know, massive sort of capitalistic chains of responsibility from me as a consumer, all the way through maybe three, five, 10, 15 different corporations, all the way to, you know, a worker in an abattoir who actually wields the knife. And that worker is themselves exploited and has very little choice about the work they're doing and is, in a way, a victim of the system. How does an approach that thinks about the criminality of that chain of responsibility work? Would crimes against animality victimize the, the slaughterhouse worker who themselves is being exploited? Would it focus on the corporations that organize and drive that work? Would it focus on the consumer's responsibility for having paid this system to carry out these crimes? How, do you have a sense about how we can navigate that sort of challenge with a criminal lens? And But it's also interesting to recognize that even in, for example, plant-based agricultures, animals are harmed and killed, right? So how do we cope with a potential criminality in that context? You know, is there an incidental harms versus deliberate harms or anyway that's too big a question but if you looked at you know the in international animal agriculture industry or international agriculture as a whole and applied your crimes against animality lens to it how can we navigate through some of those complexities yeah that's a very good question and the answer is not easy Actually, this is a question we are also reflecting on this collective paper and also on the reports that we will deliver afterwards. 
And we will go step by step. As I said, the, the ending factory farming, actually, there's a, plat- there's a platform launched by uh, Compassion in World Farming. I don't know if you know it, with other NGO participating called End It. And so this is, this is a final goal. And I think that before reaching this point, we will have time to think of this chain of responsibility and probably the big company that are behind. But in this chain of responsibility, we can think of, of raising animals in factory farms. We can think of, of this long transportation, sometimes on thousands of kilometers in horrible conditions. And yes, we can think of the endpoints in the slaughterhouse. When, where animals are killed. And yes, it would be an ideal world if international criminal law would solve all the problem, but we know it's not the case. It's not because crimes against humanity are prohibited in international law that it stopped happening. Unfortunately, it can still happen. The difference I see is that as far as we know, it's not right that it's not only unlawful, but horrible types of crimes. It, it's happening less and, and not in the same state of mind, probably. So when, if one day crimes against animality are recognized and that torturing, sequestrating, deporting, slaughtering animals would be considered as a crime against animalities, there will be probably a series of crimes where we can find as as now for for human crimes the the responsibles behind and they can be as you said individuals they can be companies and they can be states for instance the states that still allow rule fightings to happen if they are considered as crimes against animality and they deliberately still continue to allow bull fightings in their territory, then the state can be said, you are still allowing what we are considering to be a crime against animality. So here we can also think of other kind of diplomatic sanctions or, or whatever. International law also have this possibility to have different type of party or in criminal law, it's more often individuals, but we can also think of, of companies that, that can be held responsible for these crimes. When organized crimes, for instance, in the frame of or- organized crime, it can be a group of persons. So, so yes, there's many, many possibilities to, to think about here. And it's, it's a new project. There is a lot to do, not to say almost all to do, for crimes against animals to be one day recognized and prohibited in international law. And yes, it's, it's very good to, to be able to first raise this idea and begin this new movement for world animal justice. And yes, thank you very much, Jamie, for, for this opportunity. It's such a pleasure, such a pleasure. Uh, yeah, and I look forward to a future where, you know, maybe we have a universal declaration of sentient rights, but we've also thanks to your work, recognised crimes against animality or maybe even crimes against sentientity as a sort of integrated problem. I have a bit of a bias for these sort of integrated approaches. But yeah, no, that's very powerful. Thank you. And it's clear you're at the early stages of what is a very ambitious vision and mission. So what's the best way of people following what you're doing at World Animal Justice? How can people help and support you, uh, whether directly or through their own sort of influencing their own legislative systems? Where would you point people? Yeah, thank you very much for this question, Jenny. Uh, well, I invite everyone to go on our, our website, at worldanimaljustice.org, where you can discover more and see how to get involved. So either if you are an expert, an NGO willing to, to support us or partner with us. And of course, if you want to generally support this initiative towards an animal revolution, for a new world of animal justice. Uh, and yes, we have also some social media like LinkedIn, where we are posting some news and some calls for actions. And we're planning to, to have some in the coming times. So I will be happy to, yeah, to keep in touch with people who want to know more or get involved or support us. We need that. We need this movement to grow. And the more we will be, uh, the better it will be because union is strength. We know that, especially in the animal movement. So it's important to be together, pushing for 
a better protection of animals worldwide. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so, And I'll include some links in the show notes so people can click through and support your work. But it's been brilliant to have you back as a guest for the second time and very best of luck with World Animal Justice. I will be supporting enthusiastically. So, Thank you very much, Jamie. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks, Sabine. Take care and I'll speak to you again soon. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Bye-bye.